Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language, writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I have a segment about Wakandan, Groot, and other languages of the Marvel Universe, a segment about how Easter and Passover are related linguistically, and finally, a familect story about misunderstood pronouns. Kind of. But first, today we're supported by the Next Generation Bona Premium Spray Mop for hardwood floors. This amazing mop comes with a microfiber cleaning pad and hardwood floor cleaner, so you can clean your hardwood floors quickly, easily, and effectively with no dulling residue left behind. It's the perfect solution for simply beautiful floors. Bona Premium Spray Mop is available on Amazon, at Bona.com, and at most retailers where floor cleaning products are sold. For exclusive offers and more, visit bona.com slash grammar. April 26th is the release date for Avengers Endgame, which wraps up a 22-movie story arc in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The film that started it all, Iron Man, was released in 2008. Since then, Marvel has released 21 separate movies, all with distinct but interconnected storylines. To say that fans are excited about the coming conclusion is an understatement. And spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Avengers Infinity War, you might want to skip ahead about five minutes. Okay, in that film, an alien known as Thanos, the Mad Titan, collects six Infinity Stones, powerful artifacts that existed before the universe was created. He uses their combined power to destroy half the galaxy in one fell swoop. When Endgame comes out, we'll find out what happens next. Will some of our favorite superheroes remain piles of dust? Will the remaining ones recover from their grief? Will the entire universe ever go back to normal? All will be revealed in a few short days. To celebrate, we're going to talk about some of the languages featured in the Marvel movies. And by the way, if you like hearing about fantastic languages, check out our April 4th episode on the languages of the Game of Thrones. First off, there's Wakandan. That's the Earth language spoken by T'Challa, Shuri, Nakia, and everyone else in Wakanda, the technologically supercharged African nation depicted in Black Panther. Two other languages are spoken there, Hausa and Yoruba, and most citizens also speak English and several other African and European languages. Wakandan, unlike other Marvel languages, wasn't made up by a language creator. It's a real language, Isikosa, that's spoken in South Africa by more than 8 million people. The director of the movie, Ryan Coogler, said he wanted to include as much of the language in the movie as possible. He employed native speakers, translators, and dialect coaches to make it happen. Next, there's Groot. Groot is the name of a language and also the name of the sentient alien tree from the Guardians of the Galaxy. He's from the planet Flora Colossi, and he's an adorable, grumpy little creature. He says only three words, I am Groot. But that doesn't mean he's missing a language. Groot can only form those three sounds because his larynx is made of wood, and therefore pretty stiff. But his inflection can give them a host of different meanings, from I don't like hats, to they're looking at me funny. Groot also means big in Dutch, Afrikaans, and Flemish, so you can giggle to yourself when watching the movies thinking of Groot saying, I am big, over and over. One final fact about Groot. In the final scene of Infinity War, Groot reaches out for help to Rocket, his close friend and human-raccoon hybrid. An executive producer of the movie, James Gunn, has said that the words I am Groot in this scene mean simply dad. As Guardian is the language spoken by Odin and Frigga, their children, Thor, Loki, and Hela, and other citizens of Asgard. Asgard is a celestial realm that's connected to Midgard, our world, by a rainbow bridge called Bifrost. Asgard and the characters who populate it are based on real-life Norse mythology. The word Asgard comes from two old Icelandic words, Aesir, meaning gods, and Garor, meaning enclosure or dwelling. Asgard is thus the dwelling of the gods. The name of the hammer wielded by Thor, Mjolnir, 
may have come from an Indo-European root word meaning lightning. It may also be related to the Icelandic words mjöl, meaning new snow, and mjali, meaning white. The Cree are blue-skinned humanoids from the planet Hala. The Skrull's arrival race are shapeshifters with lizardy skins. Their home planet, Skrullos, was destroyed by the Cree. The Cree speak the Cree language. The Skrull speak several languages, probably because they've been forced to spread out across a number of planets. Their dialects include Fridi, Urdu, and Tligi. The Chitari are a cybernetic alien species that has also fought the Kree. They attacked Earth in the first Avengers movie, serving as Loki's air force and army. The Chitari language is noteworthy because it contains 192 ways to say the word hate. Centaurian is the language spoken by Yondu, a reaper who saved the young Star-Lord from being delivered into the murderous hands of his father, Ego. Yondu's language, which we don't hear much in the Marvel movies, consists of grunts, clicks, and whistles. But I take that back. We do hear his whistle, which controls the movement of the arrows he can send flying after his enemies. The arrows respond because they're made of yaka, a metal from Centauri that's highly sensitive to sound. Finally, it's worth mentioning Ebony Maw, one of Thanos' henchmen. He's an alien with powers of telekinesis and the creepy habit of flying around completely vertical. Like the assassin Gamora, he was taken from his homeworld and adopted by Thanos. Although we only hear Ebony Maw speak English, one of his superpowers is his voice. He's known as a whisperer. His words act like weapons that can break down an opponent's will so Ebony Maw can take over their mind. In the Marvel comic books, not the movies, his voice was so persuasive that he was able to control the mind of the mental master, Doctor Strange. And one final note. The Marvel character Kamala Khan, who can stretch her body to superhuman size, isn't in the Avenger movies. But her signature phrase, embiggen, was added to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary in 2018. The word has been in use since the mid-1990s and is probably more often associated with the TV show The Simpsons, where it first appeared. But in an interview, Kamala Khan's co-creator, G. Willow Wilson, said she was thrilled that the character's power word had made it into the dictionary. And if you plan to go see Avengers Endgame, we hope you're thrilled and enjoy the languages a little bit more. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as dragonflyedit. Before we get to Easter and Passover, are you too busy to make it to the post office? Stamps.com brings all the amazing services of the U.S. Post Office right to your computer. You can print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send. Then all you have to do is drop your mail in the mailbox. It's perfect for a small office sending invoices, an online seller shipping products, or even a warehouse sending thousands of packages a day. Plus, you get five cents off every first-class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail. It's a great deal, and all for only a fraction of the cost of those expensive postage meters. And right now, you, my listeners, can get a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Grammar. That's Stamps.com and enter Grammar, Stamps.com, and the code Grammar. Today, we're also sponsored by an innovative financial firm called Aspiration. Aspiration doesn't want to be like the big banks, where high fees are common and your deposits could be used to help the bank invest in oil pipelines and other unsustainable practices. With Aspiration, you get more money in your pocket and more power to do good. They offer a 2% annual percentage yield, zero ATM fees anywhere in the world, and the option to choose your own monthly fee, even if it's zero. Plus, 10% of Aspiration's earnings go to charity. And they give cashback rewards for shopping at socially conscious businesses. That's why Aspiration's been featured in Forbes, The New York Times, and Money Magazine. Everyone deserves a financial firm that helps you make more money while making a difference. Put your money where your heart is. 
Download the Aspiration app to open an account, earn 2% annual interest, pay zero ATM fees, and save the planet while you're at it. Aspiration. Download the app today. Most of you probably have a basic understanding of the Easter and Passover holidays, but I'll give you a quick summary before we get to the language part. Easter is a Christian holiday that celebrates the day that Jesus, known as the Son of God in the Christian faith, was said to be resurrected from the dead. It's Christianity's oldest festival, and it's observed on the Sunday following the first full moon after the spring equinox. Passover is a Jewish holiday that celebrates the Jewish people's liberation from slavery in ancient Egypt. It also recognizes the night that God was said to pass over Jewish homes and spare them from a plague that killed all other firstborn children. Passover lasts seven or eight days, depending on where it's being celebrated. It begins on the 15th day of the Hebrew month Nisan, which falls during late March and early April. What many people may not know about these two holidays is that they have a related linguistic history, at least in some languages. Let me explain. Passover comes from the Hebrew word Pesach, which means to pass or spring over. And in most European languages, the word for Easter also has this root. For example, the French word for Easter is Pâque. The Dutch word is Passe. And the Spanish expression is Pascua de Resurrección. Why is Easter so closely associated with Passover? Because Jesus was a Jewish person. His last meal, what Christians call the Last Supper, was a Passover celebration. Jesus was executed during Passover week, and he was said to come back to life three days later. In fact, early Christians celebrated Easter on the same day as Passover, regardless of what day of the week it fell on. Nowadays, it's always celebrated on a Sunday. This change came after about 300 years of controversy that rocked the church hierarchy. Sometime in the 1600s, the leaders finally decided that, yeah, Sunday would be the big day. In contrast to most European languages, English and German have a different word for Easter, which is called Ostern in German, and the root word is a little less certain. One theory was suggested by the 7th century scholar Bede, He stated that Easter was named after a pagan god of the dawn, Ostre, whose festival was celebrated around the spring equinox. That's an awesome and logical story, especially because we know that early Christians did try to merge many pagan holidays and rituals into Christianity. But it's probably not true. Historians haven't found any other sources that support this idea. It's more likely that Easter came from the old Germanic word Oster, meaning east which in turn came from the classical Latin word aurora, meaning dawn. The concept seems to be that Jesus rose from his tomb at dawn, just like the sun rises from the east at dawn. Seems like a bit of a stretch, but it's the best etymological explanation we've got. Interestingly enough, there's yet a third variation on what Easter is called around the world. In most Slavic languages, Easter is known as the Great Day or the Great Night. In Bulgarian, for example, it's called Velikden, the Great Day. In Slavic, Velkonos, the Great Night. In yet a fourth variation, some languages use the direct translation of resurrection or resurrection festival to mean Easter. These include Bosnian, Chinese, Croatian, and Korean. Finally, remember that since Easter and Passover are holidays, you capitalize them. You'd also capitalize related holy days, such as Ash Wednesday, Maundy Thursday, Sukkot, and Hoshana Rabbah. However, you don't capitalize words that fall next to these days. For example, if you wrote about an Easter service, you'd lowercase the s in service. If you wrote about the Passover festival, you'd lowercase the f in festival, and so on. So that's our discussion for today. The word Easter in most European languages comes from the Hebrew word Pesach, which means Passover. The two words have a shared etymology and an intertwined history. And if you're celebrating, we hope you have a lovely holiday. That segment was also written by Samantha Enslin. 
Next, I have a Familect story from Laurel that's a little different from the other stories I've played for you. But I thought it was especially interesting because it shows how children can consistently make the same mistake when a name is like another word. It feels like a linguistics story to me. Hi, my name is Laurel, and I live in San Francisco, where my brother attended a preschool preschool called Eureka Learning Center in the late 1980s. And everyone said, oh, you're going to love your preschool Eureka Learning Center. And so he started calling it my Eureka Learning Center. Fast forward to when my son went there in 2006, and we said, oh, you're just going to love Eureka Learning Center. Sure enough, pretty quickly, he started calling it Eureka, my Eureka Learning Center. And we talked to the teachers and said how his uncle used to call it my Eureka Learning Center. And they said, oh, yes, once in a while, people would start calling it that. So there was even a time where we went on a field trip, and he kept calling it my Eureka Learning Center. And one of the other kids said, no, no, it's everyone's Eureka Learning Center. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks, Laurel. If you'd like to share your Familect story, you can leave a voicemail at 833214-GIRL, and you might hear it on the show. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl, an author of seven books, including the New York Times bestseller, Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing. And thanks to my audio producer, Nathan Sems. This show is part of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network, and you can find articles that go with each episode at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all. Thanks for listening. Bye.